So let me invite moderator Dr. Harshul Tat. Yeah, thank you very much. I uh, I welcome all of you uh, this session. I think under the apple tree. Today we have with us Chairman Dr. Ashok Kumar Grover. Is Ashok sir there? Right here. Yeah, sir. Sir, welcome, sir. Then Dr. Chitra will be joining us soon. And we have convener Dr. Rohit Saxena. And we have panelists Dr. Shrinivas, Dr. Satyji, Dr. Anaga with us. And we have our honorable judges who will be uh, judging all the participants. We have Dr. Uh, Gopal Pillai, Dr. Mandita Goel, Dr. Vinod Kumar Aroda, Dr. Yeah. Prashant Kesha Raoul uh, Blake, Dr. Dinesh Kar, Dr. Sonu Goel, Dr. Kuwenda Basin, Dr. Anirudh Mehti, Dr. Moon Rajan, Dr. Anas Mulidhar, Dr. Alan Kumar, Dr. Raj Actually, I'm coming in the place of Mohan Rajan, Dr. Sujat. They were just Welcome. in the session. Yeah. Welcome, ma'am. Welcome. I think uh, let's start with the uh, first speaker. The first speaker is uh, Dr. Anjali Khadia. This topic is magic ball of swing. So each presentation uh, will be of five minutes, and after five minutes. Uh, the presentation will be shut down and we have two minutes of discussion. So judges will be asking you questions about your presentation. Can we have Dr. Anjali Khadia? Yeah, before we start, can I request to those who are not speaking to please keep on mute so that we have a smooth operation. Thank you so much. I always find difficulty in making my sorry. Uh, myself, Dr. Anjali Khadia. I am presenting Magic Ball of Star Christmas. I always find difficulty in making my students understand the concepts of strabismus. Even with the help of videos, I thought of a three-dimensional model will help them inculcate the concepts better. So. I thought of demonstrating all the aspects of squint using our magic ball of strabismus. This model was made out of a stand to mount the eyeball, a transparent plastic ball simulating the eyeball, dinoplast for the extraocular muscles and sticks to demonstrate the fixed axis. To give residents an idea of extraocular movements and surgeries, we pasted the dinoplast in proportion to the human eyeball dimensions which was five times smaller than our model. The sticks representing the fixed axis intersect at the center of rotation of the globe. The muscle plane and the listings plane were marked using cardboard sheets. This video demonstrates the various angles involved in the strabismus. The stable stick will be the optical axis. The movable stick, which is the visual axis, first goes towards the fovea and as it is brought anteriorly at the first black point at the center of rotation demonstrates gamma angle then with the nodal point it forms the alpha angle and at the pupillary axis it forms the angle kappa next we move on to the extraocular muscle actions we would like to demonstrate the action of two extraocular muscle superior rectus and superior oblique using a magic eyeball. The primary action of the superior rectus muscle is elevation, while the secondary and tertiary action being in torsion and adduction. The same has been depicted in our model. In primary position, the superior rectus muscle is at 23 degrees to the visual axis and exhibits all the primary, secondary and tertiary actions of the muscle. When the globe is abducted to the 23 degrees, it acts as a pure elevator along the x-axis and on adducting the globe to 67 degrees, it acts as a pure indotor along the y-axis. For the superior oblique muscle, the primary action is in torsion and the secondary action is depression and the tertiary action being abduction. Regarding the surgical concepts of strabismus, we have explained the procedures of recession, resection, adjustable suture, Faden's procedure, and inferior oblique weakening procedures. In recession, we have detached the muscle and attached it posteriorly using a double tape. In resection, we have detached the muscle 
and have taken the muscle anteriorly and attached to the original insertion point with the bracketed area showing the resected part of the muscle. Here we have shown both the bow tie and the sliding noose type of adjustable suture using a paper tag. In bow tie type, the paper tag along with the muscle is inserted at the original insertion point and a bow tie is made, thereby weakening the muscle. In sliding noose type, we have tied another suture to the pre-existing suture which can be tightened and loosened with ease. The physics behind the Faden's procedure is very intricate and we have tried to make it simpler. In Faden's procedure, we will attach the muscle posterior to the equator so that the distance from the center of rotation to the new point of insertion which is posterior to the equator is reduced without any change in the primary position. When the eyeball is moved to the Faden side, then further shortening occurs, but on movement to the opposite side, there is no effect. For the demonstration of the inferior oblique weakening, we have shown its anatomical landmark with respect to the fovea. Subsequently, we have depicted the recession and the anterior transposition of the inferior oblique muscle. Our model is a prototype, low-cost, do-it-yourself model which is easily modified according to the teaching requirements. This model turns residents' imagination to a visual reality. Thank you, sir. Actually, it is a teaching model for the residents because the strabismus surgery and extracular movement is very difficult to understand in uh, two-dimensional. And three-dimensional, it is, can easily visualize and it is transparent also. So what uh, reset recession procedure is there. So what have, what happened after the reset recession procedure, whether muscles relax or not. And uh, thank you. Very nice. So uh, Dr. Very, Gupal Pillai. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, Dr. Anjali, it was a really a nice presentation. I really liked it. It is one of the most difficult uh, for the postgraduates to actually understand the movement of muscles. And you have simplified it with such a wonderful model. So congratulations, first of all. But let me ask you a couple of questions. Number one, what are the limitations of your model as of now what you see? And what are the further improvements in the model that you would consider by the end of this next year? Thanks. Well, uh, limitation of this is that uh, I not we are not able to demonstrate the actual feeling of the surgery. Only we are demonstrating the uh, fundamental, basic thing. And uh, later I do better for the uh, surgical uh, and expansion, like uh, in the plastic board. Yeah, the fadden you are able to do, but uh, probably the recession resections. Yeah, yeah. That also. You may have a, you know, something like a, a Velcro, which is attached from both sides so that, you know, you, know, you can resect or you can actually uh, recess. So like that, that would be a little better from both sides. If you can have a Velcro sort of a system, that would be nice. And secondly, uh, it's a, is it a little large to handle so that, you know, it may fall down multiple times while you are fixing it? Because larger size it, uh, is there so that... Uh, Student can understand it uh, right. means uh, 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 visualization is better. That is why I took a larger size. But uh, whatever it is, have... it's a beautiful do it yourself for teaching the postgraduates as well as undergraduates the uh, mechanisms of action. Congratulations, man. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anjali and Dr. Gopal Pillai. So uh, there's uh, one change I would like to inform all of you that in place of Dr. Prashant, we have Dr. Rashmin Gandhi as uh, one of the judge. We welcome you, Dr. Rashmin. So next is Dr. Partha Sarthi Roy. Uh, Dr. Harshul, I'm not seeing pa Dr. Partha Sarthi here. Can we go for Dr. Ritika till then? Okay. So is Dr. Ritika there? Yes, sir. I'm, I'm here, sir. Okay, so Dr. Ritika Malik, she'll be uh, speaking on lab on chip, a new dimension in ocular surface diagnosis. Dr. Ritika? Yes. And is my request screen. Dr. Vinod Kumar Aroda to be ready with his questions for her. Is Dr. Ritika, we can see your screen. Yeah, you can see my screen? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, uh, just give me a second. <clears throat> oh. Right. 
So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. At the onset, I would like to thank AIOC and uh, thinking under the Apple Tree Treaty, giving me the opportunity to present my innovation, Lab on Chip, a new dimension in ocular surface diagnosis. So, I have no financial disclosures. To begin with, what did COVID-19 teach us in the past one year? It taught us the power of rapid diagnosis, it taught us the power of immunology, and it taught us how to modulate to control the disease. And this led us to think that there is a lot happening in our body for which we need to use this knowledge gap to personalize the medicine according to the changes occurring in our body. So where is the knowledge gap in our daily practice of refractive surgery? It is in post classic ectasia, the occurrence of scar or haze after mitomycin C, neuropathic pain, which can't be explained, dry eye disease, which is not uh, improving with treatment. So these knowledge gaps led us to thinking about the molecules which are present in our eye. So there are increased inflammatory cells, there is uh, LOX and collagen. So what all these cells and the LOX and collagen help us and determine is our wound healing, our haze after surgery, the ectasia. So all these molecular markers influence the surgical outcomes and response to therapy. So it is vital for us to know what we are dealing with. So we come to a research question that like we have our COVID-19 RT-PCR kit, the pregnancy kit and the glucometer kit. So can we have a point of care diagnostic kit to diagnose these ocular changes? So we came to the factor now that we have to pick the right markers. So the international groups, various studies have told us and our own uh, study group at Narayanedrale has told us that a lot of things like increased ocular discomfort, inflammation, neuropathic pain, degradation of collagen is rotated by these molecular markers. So we took this potpourri of markers and helped in building a kit. So the kit is based on the principle of like the ELISA multiplex fluorescence based antigen antibody reaction. So the antibody is lined in the wells of the kit, if you can see here, and the antigen comes from the tear cytokines. There is also second antibody, which acts like a fluorescent marker to detect in the fluorescence of the ELISA multiplex system. So the cartridge is designed as a multi-fluidic drainage kit with multiple interconnected channels with specific markers in the channel. So only one place you need to place the tears, it will flow throughout the channel and wherever the tear molecules are present, it will be picked up. So a short video to show the workflow. Uh, we use tear strips to collect the tears, waiting period of five uh, minutes. After that, we collected an Eppendorf tubes. 300 microliters of extraction buffer, phosphate bu uh, buffer is used. Shaking it well, and the tears are immersed into the tube, centrifuging it to extract the proteins. After that, pipetting out an ml of it and putting it into the test cartridge. As simple as that. Then we put it into the device, which will further read the cytokine levels. As like any lab which is giving us a report, we get like a report, like any blood report, which has a normal value. We also have a normative database for the markers. So after these reference intervals, we can see how much the markers are. What application we have to the clinics is that we can have a targeted treatment. We customize the treatment with the available drugs like uh, cyclosporin, trihalose, doxycycline, or the treatments which are coming, like the liftograph and the anti of treatments for the specific markers. In discussion, I would like to say that this kit is helpful in identifying specific biomarkers and customizing treatment for the patient. What applications we can have in our cataract surgery? We can see that these patients who have post-operative dry eye, discomfort, pain without stain, poor wound healing, we can see the markers for them and diagnose and give a tailored treatment. So what is our way forward? The way forward would be that we have already partnered with Biotechni, which is a US-based molecular diagnostic company, which will produce the kit in bulk. And after this, we will uh, send it to all over the country for the future FDA trials. In the future, we have made the kits available for the retinal con uh, conditions such as diabetic retinopathy, ROP, and the ongoing tests are done for the myopic progression by searching for the dopamine levels. And in the pipeline, is also for glaucoma. So what is already known is that incorrigible dry eye or post-operative uh, Then in conclusion, I would like to say that this is the first point of care diagnostic kit which helps us to understand disease pathology, process and treatment outcomes and provide a personalized bespoke treatment approach. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mallika. That was a great presentation. And I'll request Dr. Vinod Arora to 
please ask her questions. Yeah, it's a beautiful presentation, nicely Thank presented. Thank you. Uh, conclusions on that. I think this uh, concept is almost for the last 10 years there. Uh, can you ask, uh, I, I mean, it's very important to know the ocular changes, yes. especially when we do the surgery, we end up doing happy surgery, but unhappy patient. I think the role is, they are very important. So yes. what sort of biomarkers we are going to know about it and which biomarkers are more important for in, if you consider acute surface as such. Yes, sir. So currently what the kit has are those classical biomarkers, which all the international studies and even our studies have shown that IL-6, IL-8, IL-17A, MMP9, LOX, and uh, the VEGF-B, so, and TNF-alpha. So these are the biomarkers which we have already put in our cohort just now, and what the kit is going is telling us at the moment. So these biomarkers are classically involved in the dry eye disease, and for the after PRK, there is haze. We can see if they have inflammatory factors such as IL-17, which is high, or MMP-9, which is high, which is leading to any collagen changes. Can you tell us about the importance of this marker individually? Like you, one is telling you about the inflammation, otherwise dry eye. So what yes. are the importance of these markers? So, uh, so all these markers, what happens that uh, these markers are specific to the disease condition. Like ocular discomfort has classically an increase of IL-17A and VEGF beta. Degradation of LOX and collagen, which is mostly seen in post-classic ectasia or progression of keratoconus, has an increased levels of IL-6 and MMP9. Degradation of collagen also is directed by a decrease in the lysyl oxidase. And also classical condition, which is the neuropathic pain or the pain without stain has an increased level of IL-17A and increased level of MMP9. So these are the sectors where we can use the molecules to see what a disease is progressing to. I think it's a very nice talk and you have uh, beautifully presented all the points. Thank you, Thank sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And thank you, Dr. Ritika, for a nice presentation. So let's move on to the next presenter. And uh, Do next Dr. we Hushul? have... Yes. Uh, Dr. Hushul, we have Dr. Partha back now. We can just ask Dr. Partha. He's the second speaker. Okay, okay Dr. Partha, sir. Okay. okay. So next uh, we have... Uh, am, I, am, I, am I audible, sir? Yes, sir, you're yes. audible. Uh, can I share my screen? Yes, can sir. Okay. Yes, sir. So, Dr. Partha Dati Roy will be speaking on minimal cycloplegic in dilated drops solved the problem of gastrorexis in her mature intermittent cataract. And I'll request Dr. Malika Goel to be there to ask question to him. Actually, screen, oh, screen, screen, screen. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Hello, good morning. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My uh, invention is minimal cycloplegic in dilated drops solves the problem of capsular extis in hypermature intumescent cataract. This invention was displayed in. Start my video. This invention was displayed in Scientific Film Festival of ASCRS Annual Conference San Diego 2019. Also presented as free paper session of AIOC Indoor 2019. The problem of capsulorexis in hypermature intumescent cataract is known to all the cataract surgeons. There are some techniques have evolved over the times, but none is satisfactory. I exploited a natural physiological phenomenon to solve the problem. See, on the left of your screen, accommodated form of lens, and on the right side, the relaxed form of the lens. In the relaxed form of the lens, the ciliary body is away from the lens equator, and the, the jonules are relaxed. Whereas in the uh, accommodated, uh, jonules are taut, rather, the, the anterior capsule is taut. And in the accommodation, uh, accommodated form of lens, the uh, ciliary body comes closer to the uh, equator of the lens and the jonules are relaxed and anterior capsule becomes lax and flaccid. The current practice is to include cycloplegic like homotropin, topicamide or cyclopentolate in preoperative pupillary dilated agent. Is cyclopegia a blazing or bane during hypermature cataract surgery? 
see the fincom's classical depiction of capsule in different stages of accommodation the when the capsule is maximally accommodated state the capsule is slack whereas in accommodated state capsule is taut in the left side capsule is taut in the right side in maximally accommodated state capsule is slack so my hypothesis no hypo, uh, cycloplegia approach in order to facilitate favorable capsular behavior during capsular axis in the absence of cyclopegia lens is relatively in accommodated state accommodated state zonal remains relaxed capsule remains flaccid capsular behavior is favorable rather than hostile in no cyclopegia approach the central theme is minimization of cyclopegia dilator regimen in the order of installation is as follows 5% tumoral malleate i drop one drop 40 minutes before operation to block the beta 2 receptor mediated relaxing effect on the ciliary muscle freshly prepared 5% phenylephrine eye drop by dissolving uh, pure powder in normal saline four times at 5 minutes interval one in four dilution of commercially available 1% topicamide eye drop one drop once or twice only and then at the falbitropen eye drop as usual we have conducted a randomized control trial 61 patients with hypermature intubation cataract undergoing SICS IL surgery were randomly assigned between conventional 32 eyes and new regime 29 uh, eyes of pupillary dilatation the results and statistical analysis show good pupillary dilatation in both the groups comparable with all steps of surgical procedure ease of doing capsular axis measured in terms of frequency of completed axis was statistically significantly higher in new group than conventional group attainment of post operative bcba sig by 12 at the end of 6 weeks was statistically higher in new group compared to the conventional group however anti segment reaction of gate 3 uh in the first property period was higher in the new group than the conventional group video now showing the video you see the capsule is, in this case is 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 elastic you can see the fitting test the capsule is elastic see the behavior of the capsule with this technique now there is egress of cortical matter showing that this is actually a hypermature intubation cataract now see the behavior of the capsule it is elastic it tends to come back to its original position it stretches rather than tears you see it comes it want to come back to its normal position it is elastic rather than brittle kid kid okay you see the capsule is on the verge of completion you see another case this is the earlier case now conclusion no cycloplegia approach is novel scientific method of achieving favorable capsular behavior during capsular axis by pharmacomodulation of natural phenomenon of accommodation by this new approach good pupillary dilatation can be maintained throughout the course of surgical procedure and age old problem of ccc in hypermature intubation cataract can be overcome tumoral malleate eye drop was used for the first time in the preoperative pupillary dilator regimen for the cataract surgery thank you sir uh, thank you dr partha sathi i'll request uh, dr malika goel uh, to please ask questions relevant yeah. to this presentation very good presentation uh, very good presentation doctor and a good concept thank you uh, my only thinking was uh, in an older patient after the age of 60 what is the accommodative amplitude anyway available that this drop or its absence could make much difference to the sphericity of the lens so, that is one, one question second second question is uh, the higher incidence of inflammation noted so does do you think it is in, introducing a new risk of inflammation versus and infection because of the dilution uh, madam answering to your first question the uh, the seat of pace biopia is lying within the substance of the lens no not not on the capsule capsule reacts to the accommodative effort as usual as in the young adults also 
so uh, this is the uh, answer to your first question whether uh, presbyopia affects the accommodation uh, on uh, the capsule actually cap uh, accommodating effort of the capsule or not it is not number two uh, question answering to your number uh, two question that it is not the inflammation that is uh, it is uh, yes it may be you may call it inflammation but never never it is an infection we didn't face any infection it is because of the fact that we do not give uh, uh, give cycloplegic or we minimize the cycloplegic effect there may be some micro twitching of the um, <coughs> iris that may be occurring during the um, during the procedure that may cause some dispersion of the iris um, uh, this iris pigment but it goes within few days madam it 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 it, 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 it was not a it, not an issue of, uh, yeah. by our experience okay okay just that we need to be careful because there is one more step added now where we are diluting the drug so a lot of caution to prevent infection that's the only point i'm trying to make okay thank you uh, thank you very much dr malika and thank you dr patha sarthi now let's move on to the uh, next presentation next is uh, dr santosh agrawal will be speaking on an innovative disco chopper for automated disco delivery the boon for complicated fraco and i'll request uh, dr rashmin gandhi to be ready with uh, questions for him thank you uh, judges panel and uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, i am going to share the screen now uh, can you see the presentation oh, i am going to present the video on an innovative visco chopper through are you able to see the video yes, yes sir we can yes. see we can see thank you it acts as a two way function one uh, it acts as a chopper and also as a visco delivery system so this is uh, applied to the silicon oil port or the vitrectomy port on the console and a silicon oil system is used for this purpose instead of silicon oil we use visco and this is a knob on the foot pedal which is uh, given by the company for activation of this uh, port you can see the vfi port on the console which is specially made for this purpose by turbovit apasami machine and this is a challenging case white cataract the intracapsular pressure is very high so it is very difficult to perform the ccc in such cases and as the visco is delivered as and when necessary you can make the enterchamber deep as well as you can uh, see this the peripheral extension of uh, ccc can happen at this moment so we can inject the visco at this moment and we can avoid this uh, peripheral extension of the ccc this is the intumescent cataract we are uh, extracting the liquid cortex from the capsular bag through the tiny opening and one is injecting one port through one port we are injecting the visco through a automated visco delivery system so we can take out the fluid cortex at the same time we can inject the visco now this is the pc rate uh, which is uh, which has taken place and to avoid the extension of the pc rate we can inject the visco inside the enter chamber through this chopper so that the enter chamber depth is maintained iop is maintained and the visco will take care of pc rent and the vitreous now this is the small pupil uh, again the, it is very difficult to perform the ccc so visco can be delivered and you can have ccc with ease this is another case of hypermature cataract challenging situation here i used um, ac maintainer to deliver the visco can uh, maintain the entry chamber and uh, you can extract the fluid uh, cortex the liquid cortex through the main incision or through the extractor this is another challenging situation where the last piece of the nucleus while removing the you need good ac depth otherwise pc rent can happen this is another challenging case of lens induced glaucoma case Uh, corneal edema is there iris is coming out through the wound lot of iop pressure in spite of all measures we have taken anti glaucoma measures 
so this visco uh, inside the enter chamber can give you protection from the endothelial damage this is another scleral fixation i will case where lot of manipulation is required uh, and the chances of hypotony is is there so to avoid that the through ac maintainer visco is delivered inside the enter chamber and the iop is well maintained pediatric cataract case uh, the ccc is very difficult because of obvious reasons elastic capsule slow uh, uh, less uh, rigidity clear rigidity so to maintain the iop and enter chamber depth visco is delivered through the ac maintainer this is a hard cataract super hard cataract uh, endothelial damage can happen in routine cases but uh, with the help of visco you can avoid that and this is the manual way of uh, delivering the visco inside the enter chamber through the visco chopper and uh, initially i showed you the automated technique so this helps in a complicated cataract cases peco cases to deal with the uh, endothelial damage to maintain the ac depth uh, the manipulation are easy and to perform and the pc rent also can be managed very well and we can avoid the pc rent in most of the cases this is the silicon oil system which we have utilized for this purpose and especially visco chopper is made by 26 gauge needle and the special needle is made by the company thank you very much for your patient listening thank you very much uh, dr santosh uh, for this innovation and i'll request dr rashmin gandhi to ask question to dr santosh thank you thank you dr santosh for that video and i see that uh, you have quite a few presentation in this uh, thing under the apertry so congratulations for all your innovations a couple of uh, questions or observations in your automated system where you used uh, the silicon oil uh, system of the apaswami uh, uh, so you you press the foot pedal to have a burst of visco uh, did i understand it right is, that's yes. how it yes there is a special knob given by the company i requested them to have a separate knob otherwise what happen uh, while doing the feco you cannot inject the visco you have to come out from the feco then you have to again go to the uh, silicon oil port activate it and again pour the visco so i have uh, asked them or requested them to have a separate uh, knob for that and they have given that that is available in now your machines in appa so uh, can you control how much visco goes in and does the viscosity and pseudo plasticity of the material affect how much visco will go in let's say uh, uh, a dispersive visco elastic versus a highly coerced visco elastic does it matter when you use that system i am most of the time i have used hpmc only 2% hpmc and uh, the injection of the visco is very slow and uh, it's very less quantity means maybe 0.05 or 0.1 cc only at one time so if you press continuously you will get more visco so that control is there okay the yeah. nice nice uh, nice innovation and i'm sure as you uh, as demonstrated also the cases where this can be useful like pc rent where you know you you don't have time you have a uh, your hands free to do what you want to do while you press the foot pedal and let the visco go in thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rashmin and Dr. Santosh. So next we have Dr. Arun. Uh, is Dr. Arun there? Is Dr. Uh, Spriya Arun is there? I think she is not here. Okay. Okay. So, Actually, I have got two presentations. we have dr isha gupta next okay so let's take uh, dr isha gupta so next we have dr isha gupta dr santosh is two presentations or uh, dr santosh you have two presentations right yes yes so is it okay yeah. we can take it after isha gupta ji okay okay sir thank no you problem. thank you oh no no his his presentation is only next no yes dr harshul yeah. please take a call Yeah, yeah. No, Dr. Santosh, uh, you go for your next presentation. It's indirect ophthalmoscope along with uh, innovative slit-like device to be used as slit lamp. Okay. Thank you once again for giving me opportunity. And I'll request Dr. Dinesh Kerr uh, to be ready with questions for him. Sure, sir. 
I am Dr. Santosh Agrawal. I am going to present a new device which can be utilized along with indirect ophthalmoscope as a slit lamp. So, indirect ophthalmoscope, while after uh, examining the retina, we can also see the anterior segment structure with the slit images. So, I have device a slit lamp like structure. This device has LED light system with on and off switch. And this is a pipe at one end. There is a slit in the black paper. And this is the slit image, slit light image, which we can see very well. In torch light, it is not possible. I have tried that. So I have devised this new slit light. And this can be utilized in along with indirect ophthalmoscope so that the corneal and uh, anterior segment structures and mainly the cataract can be assessed just like a slit lamp with magnification, with good illumination. Now this is the slit image of the anterior segment. We can grade the cataract, we can see the corneal details in slit images, corneal ulcers, corneal opacities, aqueous flare and cataract grading can be done in a busy practice, many times it is not possible to see with slit lamp and indirect ophthalmoscope. So for a busy practitioner or in the periphery, we can utilize indirect ophthalmoscope for observation of the retina structures as well as we can utilize as a slit lamp. So this is an innovative method to utilize the indirect ophthalmoscope uh, as a slit lamp also. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Santos. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Santosh. It was can I, can we a have nice. A uh, thank you, Dr. Santosh Agarwal. It was uh, a nice innovation, and uh, uh, you have used LED light, isn't it? Like, uh, you have yes. used a LED light to make it into a slate. So, yes. I just wanted to know, like, uh, are you using the indirect of thermoscope uh, illumination also? No, no. At the, uh, while watching the entry segment structure, we have to switch off the indirect light. And we have to use this slit image. Yeah, I'm using that slit light. Uh, and uh, you are using the magnification of uh, the lens. And you are using the binocularity of the indirect of thermoscope. Yeah, so, so that's see. mainly in slit lamp uh, examination, uh, we uh, usually have coaxial illumination especially for uh, uh, retro illumination and other examination. So will that be available here? Because this is not a coaxial system, isn't it? Yeah, but we can move the slit light and we can make it coaxial also. So uh, as you move the slit at Limbus, you, if you want the retro illumination, it's also possible. But it's a crude method. It is not, uh, you cannot replace slit lamp with this uh, device. But for a busy practitioner, and if you are working in a periphery, so most of the time, yeah. there is no need of slit lamp. And you don't get that much time to observe in both the uh, devices you, you, you cannot use. So, sure, sure. Uh, that, yeah, actually, the portable slit lamps are not very popular in our country. So especially if you are uh, seeing patients in some ICU or some peripheral um, area where uh, slit lamp cannot be taken long. This can be a very useful device to, uh, to help you uh, uh, screen the anterior segment. I yes. think uh, it's a great innovation from your side. Yes. Great. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dinesh Gar. Any other questions? There is still some time. No, left. I think, yeah, please. I think okay. this is the thank you, Lord. thank you. I think this is just a replacement of slit lamp, and uh, not much than, more than that. So slit lamp gives you a better uh, image if you compare with this instrument. So this is just a yeah. jawar for slit lamp. That's all. Can I ask a question? Or is it, yes, yes, yeah. Malika, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this uh, device is it a torch on which you have put a slit, or is it something special on which you have put a slit? I initially okay. tried with torch, ma'am, but uh, it won't give that much uh, good illumination or the slit. So uh, I tried with this uh, LED lamp, and this LED with this my uh, jugar, the that comes out very well, and I could see uh, the inter-segment structure uh, with good uh, just like a slit lamp. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you
but we can replace lead lamp ma'am understood is this led is this led device available easily led yes yes ma'am is it available easily no no ma'am i made it uh, just for my sake and i am using it for last one year and uh, uh, some company should come forward and make it more sophisticated actually hmm. Yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, it's actually a uh, LED light. Uh, these uh, LED lamps are normally uh, available, and he has used a cardboard uh, roll, I think, uh, to put this. And in front, he has used a, a black paper to make it a slit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a. I think it's a very so, good device. Uh, very light good. Light illumination is usually less. Yeah. Torch light illumination is usually much less. LED must be around uh, say 10 watt or 12 watt, but uh, there are uh, portable slit lamps available in international market, but uh, they are not very popular here. And uh, when you um, uh, see a patient and uh, who is not able to sit up or stand or like in um, in um, ICU areas or even in periphery, probably this will be of uh, of course. Uh, retro illumination and other things like for a coaxial illumination those those things are not there so it's a, a good alternative to that so that, that's what my uh, take would be thank you very much thank you dr dinesh and thank you dr santosh thank you sir now let's move on to dr isha gupta uh, we will be speaking on dented cystitome real time capsulorexis measurement and i request dr purinde basin to be there to ask the question dr isha gupta yes uh, greetings respected judges and panelists uh, am i audible sir yes yes please go ahead okay. greetings respected judges and panelists and delegates i am dr isha gupta dnb resident i will share a short presentation on dented cystitome a real time capsular axis measurement Excuse me, just a second. Okay. Sorry for the technical glitch. Uh, can you hear the voice, sir? Yes. Yeah, we can hear the voice, but we can't see. But you can. Oh, just just a second. Sir. Share screen me what? Yeah? Doctor Isha, is there anything I can help you with? Yeah. Okay. Do yeah, you see at the bottom? Second, what are the buttons you see at the bottom of your screen on Zoom? Uh, can you see it now, sir? No. Can you see my screen? So now I have no. started sharing the content. Yeah, yeah. Now we can see. Yeah, yeah. We can see. Sorry, sorry for the technical. So no conflict of interest or financial gains to declare. Resident, my most tense moments of cataract surgery is during capsular excess. All I want is to make the perfect and adequate capsular axis. Thus, I focused on innovating a real-time guide for adequate capsular axis, so that we can measure it while making it. Achieving a circular, central, and adequate capsular axis of 5.5 to 6 mm is no easy task, especially for a beginner like me. Smaller capsular axis poses difficulty in nucleus prolapse during MSICS. IL implantation also becomes problematic, and it can lead to capsular back distension syndrome or capsular con contraction in the post-operative period. Whereas a larger capsular axis has a chance of axis runoff, causing posterior capsular rupture, nucleus herniation into anterior chamber during phaco emulsification. and exposed optic edge causing lens decentration and optical aberrations post operatively 
We already have a wide buffet of innovative techniques and instruments to choose from and make the perfect capsule or excess. Like the ocular surface corneal impression marker, the intraocular ring calipers, a variant guided capsular excess system, the zepto rexis, and the femto laser assisted rexis. But all of these have limited use and bear the additional cost. We were looking for one simple solution that has no additional cost and can be widely employed in all cataract surgeries. It was derived from our basic cataract trolley of instruments and helps in skill development of a novice surgeon. We called it the dented cystitome. Its preparation requires the use of three basic surgical instruments that is a curved anatomy scissor, 26 gauge needle cystitome and a castrovigo calipers. Set the caliper at required excess radius that is 2.5 mm in case of equimulsification and use it to mark this distance from cystitome tip with a marker. Press on the mark distance firmly with the tenotomy scissors. Interoperatively, the corneal reflection from microscope is assumed as rexus center and rexus flap is raised keeping the dent on the cystitome in alignment with this center. Circular and etiquette rexus can thus be made by repeatedly using the dented cystitome as a guide. Surgical landmarks to be aligned are the central corneal reflection, cystitome tip, the dent and the rexus margin. This way, a uniform, adequate, continuous curvilinear capsulorexis can be performed. This simple novel modification is an advantageous beginner's tool to perfect the art of capsulorexis under real-time measurement. The proportions are not affected by corneal magnification and the size can be easily modified on a case-by-case -case requirement. Please stop sharing yes, your screen, Dr. Isha. Yes, sir. Okay, good. So, I'll request Dr. Purinde Basi. Is there? Is Dr. Purinde Basi there? Okay. Uh, okay, I'll request Dr. Gopal Pillay if you heard her presentation, if you saw her presentation, Dr. Pillai. Ashil, I can ask a question if you want. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Dr. Rajesh Shekhar is there. Yes. yes sir. Sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. You said it's good for beginners, uh, you know, beginners will be struggling themselves to do a rexis. If they see another mark, will their attention not go off? No, sir. We need not see the mark constantly. It is just a guide to uh, guide the uh, beginner in achieving the perfect size of the rexis because we won't stop at rexis. For my greatest fear would be if I make a smaller rexis, I will never be able to take the nucleus out during SICS. So anyways, a surgeon has to multitask. You cannot be seeing just one point and doing the surgery. So I guess it will be a good guide to help them achieve that. Uh, what are the difficulties you faced while using this technique? Sir, uh, the only thing was that uh, I had to measure it every time I was in doubt. I have to like move the, which is on the edge of the capsular axis, I have to move the cystitome to the center of the axis to measure. That is the only additional uh, maneuver that I had to do. Otherwise, it was the same as doing a routine, uh, using a routine cystitome. I have a question. But the advantage was, yes, yes ma'am, please. I think time is up. I have a yes. question. Yes, ma'am, please. Yeah, actually, uh, my question is that uh, the in the dent that she has made is just to measure, you know, it's like a radius. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. So when you are doing your lexus in the video that you had shown, your yes, needle yes. was moving every time. So if the central point is not the same, then having a radius of the same doesn't have much uh, use because every time the radius will keep changing according to the centration. Then how will you ensure that your uh, Lexus is round and of a particular uh, dimension? Yes, ma'am. So uh, globe centration is definitely very important. We assume the corneal reflection of the microscope, the Perkins image as the globe center here. So if that is uh, the corneal reflection you can see properly, then that will be the globe center, the anatomical yeah, yeah. landmark. 
even if you have the globe center as that your dent has to center with that yes, and ma'am. that is moving every time so your radius will change according to whichever is the center the, yes uh, ma'am going by the physics yes ma'am yes ma'am yes ma'am then we'll have to realign to the center and then uh, measure it how will it be effective if your center keeps changing every time yes ma'am yes ma'am ma'am you are right ma'am so that is uh, one limitation we'll have to realign the globe every time to measure okay fine uh, dr helen kumar has any question Dr. Uh, Harshul, uh, we have yes. one question from Dr. Vinod. We can take it as the last question. Yes, yes, Dr. Vinod. Yes, please, please. Uh, I was just uh, wondering. It's a good technique. I think it's a good if you do properly. Uh, you get a good capsule access. But what is the problem with the corneal marking if you pre-mark it? That's always there. You can see it. Yeah, yes. You could use it. Sir, so that is a relative marking. So if the globe is tilted. the mark uh, will relatively move in there will be a parallax error error between the corneal marking and the capsular axis okay. so since this cystitome is right in the plane of the capsular axis it will remove that parallax error okay that, that that's a valid point but on, yeah. the, normally we don't see the head is moving or being tilted uh, once we are doing yeah. surgery see sir i think what ma'am said was absolutely right that you know you can always see whether you are going in the right direction or not no again and again you need to Put visco and again see that yes. So she can get some idea that here yeah, I am going in right direction or not. So yeah, it just reduces it, the amount of instrumentation into the globe. Good. Okay, Dr. Isha. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, next we have Dr. Uh, John Davis Akara, who is uh, speaking on smartphone portable eye clinic system. There is one and, uh, presentation missing, no? In between. Uh, Artificial intelligence. Uh, yes, ma'am. There's one presentation which has not been made before. Uh, yes, ma'am. Doctor Spriya Arun is not there. They upper class. Yes. So I request uh, Doctor Anirudh Mehta. Devu, parke. Yeah, Doctor uh, Davis. I'm here, sir. I'm here, sir. Please start the presentation. Yes. Thank you. Uh, is my screen visible? Am I audible? Yeah, we can see you. Yes, yes. You and your co-presenter both. Yeah, he is there behind me. So, um, okay. So I'll start. Uh, my innovation is smartphone portable eye clinic system, which is for short specs. So this is what it looks like. It's a box, which is a magic box. I have one next to me. That's why my son is here. so it contains some essential do it yourself and uh, frugal innovations which is for eye doctors on the go let's look at what is inside that so if you open that box you will get uh, smartphones because i am a smartphone man i do a lot of innovation smartphone then there's a tab because we need bigger smartphones that uh, first thing we saw was the eye ruler i'll explain then the lenses including an iol i'll explain that also red blue glasses lit lamp adapter that's a caracan mini topographer i'll go through all of these okay virtual reality headset this is the do it yourself smartphone slit lamp and a plastic bottle so this is a typical uh, ophthalmic opd the eye clinic uh, you do a history examination and so on and go on to the slit lamp examination and the further investigations so with the smartphones you can do a lot of the history and examination so for history itself you can do in this age of social distancing um, a teleconference history and for history taking with uh, people with, of different languages you have my apps i have made i know tamil i know bangla if you have uh, a difficulty conversing in these languages this will help then uh, you have apps which you might have seen in the news recently the pulse uh, and respiratory rate uh, measuring apps which are there so you can put all these apps you can even measure pallor ictus synosis if you are so keen on doing a proper general examination coming to the ophthal part of course the tab is useful now you have the tab and a phone which can be used as a visual equity chart which can be controlled from the phone these are the apps i chart pro and the peak equity app then for stereo vision which is usually not very easily available you can use the red blue anaglyph glasses and the stereo equity testing app 
Okay. So this uses the random uh, dot stereogram and it is made for red blue glasses, not the red green glasses. And using that, you can measure stereo equity. Then for smartphone refraction, this one is not my innovation. This is from MIT, uh, Dr. Uh, Ramesh Raskar. This is a smartphone virtual reality headset refraction uh, device. This will measure the refraction uh, in uh, of the eye. For examination, again, I said the eye ruler is the measurement uh, chart. And with that, you can measure all the uh, doses and uh, interpupillary distance and all the measurements, including corneal diameter. You can use uh, eye turn and eye tilt for uh, head gaze, all, um, abnormal head posture, nine gaze app for the nine gaze positions. And this is one, uh, this is one uh, interesting thing. Just now we saw one innovation with the slit indirect ophthalmoscope. This is the mini version of that, which I had made uh, during the lockdown. This is, uh, as uh, somebody said, this is a bright uh, 10 watt LED, a nine volt uh, battery and a lens and a slit in between. So you can get a slit for examining the eye. So this is a portable slit lamp and it is made out of a urine sample bottle. This is a urine sample bottle, which I had lying around the hospital. And this is three urine sample bottles, a battery and a switch and an LED. So this is also uh, the universal smartphone adapter and a plastic bottle. We can, this is a hand sanitizer bottle in fact. We can use it to make a fundus camera. This is by Dr. Prithvi Chandrakan, my friend. And this is one innovation by myself. A Karakan mini top is a mini topographer. This is a Placido uh, a cylinder inside and LED illumination, which I put all around. And you can take uh, topography pictures using that. This is taken using this device. And this is how I aligned it to the phone to take photographs. And perimetry, as I had presented a uh, few years earlier, virtual reality headset with a smartphone inside can be used for perimetry. So this is the smartphone portable eye clinic system. Thank you. Very nice, Dr. Davis. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I'll request Dr. Andrew Methi, who is a judge. Thank you, Dr. Harshul. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate Dr. Davis for a very practical innovation. Uh, I have a couple of questions. The first is that we see a lot of app-based uh, uh, smartphone devices, like uh, how reliable are they? Are they validated with the conventional uh, methods what we use in our daily routine uh, OPDs? That's a very good question, sir. When I started doing these uh, smartphone innovations, there were not many validated smartphone apps or uh, gadgets. And uh, what I realized that was uh, there were some small, small errors in many of the apps because of which they could not be uh, as uh, uh, precise as the regular equipment. But now uh, visual equity on smartphone can be as precise or better Color vision is actually better than the low cost Isihara charts, which are available. And uh, stereo equity is precise. Uh, smartphone fundus photography, the resolution is poor, but it is uh, okay. Smartphone anterior segment photography is better than the smart, uh, the regular conventional slit lamp photography. So there are some things which are way better, some things which are okay, some things which are worse. Uh, all in all, I believe that this will only improve uh, in the future. In the coming years, smartphones are going to be very useful and uh, we will be able to do almost everything on a small device. That's the future. Uh, okay. I have another question. Uh, you had shown the uh, slit lamp device. Yes, sir. Uh, so how sensitive it is to pick up the subtle, uh, suppose we are seeing an anti how uh, how sensitive it is to pick up the cells and flare? Right, sir. So uh, right now, I do not have a separate magnifier. So what I do is I hold a 20 diopter lens in my uh, left hand and I use this in which there is actually a 78 diopter lens, if you can see. So this produces a slit illumination. This is the illumination arm. And the 20 diopter lens, which I have in my other hand, is the viewing arm of the slit lamp. So I am the slit lamp. So I hold the slit lamp uh, and adjust everything. Uh, maybe, uh, actually right now, I feel that it is not as sensitive as, uh, say, a hack stitch slit lamp to pick up cells and flare, but I'm able to see. 
if a patient has significant cells i am able to see sir. that's great that's great uh, thank you thank you very much dr anirudh and thank you so what dr. will be the okay. learning curve uh, if i can ask you uh, the learning curve of all the different parts are different for the apps i think uh, it's just a matter of getting to know how to use the app it is going to be very easy for the smartphone funders photography there is a big learning curve right now which i am trying to fix with some more uh, I, i'll get to that later so that is having a great learning curve anterior segment photography without adapter has a learning curve with adapter is easy uh, so yes there are some Thank small you. things to improve yes sir Thank you very much. Uh, very nice. Yeah. Let's move on to the next presenter, and uh, that is Dr. Jyoti uh, Tangadla. If I'm not pronouncing it wrong, so she'll be speaking on novel technique of treating pterygium with autograph using dithermy. And I'll request Dr. Sujata Mohan to be ready with questions for her. Good evening, everybody. Uh, today, I uh, thank you, Ayers, for giving me this opportunity of uh, this uh, presentation. I will be uh, describing a novel technique in pterygium excision and auto grafting using diatheremy. So, uh, I'll start the slide share. Pterygium excision and auto grafting using diatheremy. So pterygium, as you know, is a conjunctival perforation triangle and shape. Usually from the medial side, it can be from the lateral side also. Usually asymptomatic, sometimes it can be inflamed, cause redness. Main problem is that it can cover the cornea and cause refractive uh, uh, error, and the patient may come for surgery. Now, the, traditionally, we know the Brayer sclera. We also know that conjunctival autografting sclera covered with patient's own conjunctiva. in the same eye which can be done using sutures or tissue growth in this i describe the technique using diatheremy uh, we have conducted the study for 100 cases of pterygium and the mean age was 46.6 year and uh, other comorbidities were adequately controlled all cases underwent pre anesthetic checkup and post for surgery after perivalvular anesthesia uh, the regular way we just um, excise the pterygium and a measurement using vernier calipers was used the remaining pterygium excised in the hemostasis of the scleral bud main uh, bed main measurement of the scleral bud using calipers and 0.5 cm larger graft marked at the superior limbus superior limbus is infiltrated with 2% lignocaine raising the conjunctiva and leaving behind it a non capsule so the graft is harvested a little larger graft the graft is dissected leaving behind a small attachment such that we ensure that the limbal side goes to the limbal side of the recipient area also the graft is slowly slid over the cornea to be placed on the bare sclera side taking care that the limbal edge approximates the edges of the donor graft are approximated to the recipient side to the edges of the conjunctiva with diathermy four or five spots of attachments are made at the end of the surgery subconjunctival injection with dexamethasone gentamicin given and post operative care and a patch is removed after 24 hours the post operative care with steroid antibiotic eye drops given for about a week now the main thing which has to be taken care is the graft is a little larger than the recipient site About 0.5 centimeters or 5 millimeters. So on each side you have around 2 2.5 millimeters of extra graft available. We are able to approximate the edges properly using a limbs forceps, and diathermy is used at various spots. Firstly, all the corners, and in between also depending on the size of the graft. What I have noticed is the graft is taken over very well. Now out of the 100 cases, 98 patients were followed. for a period of 1 year and 75 for a period of 2 years and the patient showed very good post operative recovery with minimal pain for the first week and subsequently became totally asymptomatic the graft remained well attached and good post operative recovery was noted there was no 
unexpected case of recurrence. Removal by Bayer's Sclera technique is known to have a high rate of recurrence. Universal knowledge is that auto grafting is the best method. Securing the graft with sutures is a time tested method, but it is time consuming and tedious. A lot of discomfort and irritation to the patients due to the sutures. Of course, tissue glue is the best solution, but it is expensive. There is hardly any learning curve for this method. The technique has the following advantages. It is very simple, easy to master. No additional cost is involved. It is quick. It's giving good results and there are no side effects as such. And the patient has shown very good compliance. Only thing is the diatherapy should be used on dry conjunctival surface as well as the graft. So you have to dry the area and apply the diatherapy. In conclusion, looking at the effectiveness and the ease of the procedure, I feel that this is the way forward and it is easily learned by all ophthalmologists and easily available to everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jyoti. I'll request Dr. Sujata Mohan to please uh, yes, ask yes. questions. Yes, sir. Um, at the outset, I'd like to uh, appreciate uh, Dr. Jyoti for the wonderful new concept. Uh, it is very unique, but I think I have a couple of concerns. One is that when you're applying diatomy, you can actually, uh, if you do overdo it, then you can actually cause contraction of the tissue, so which may leave behind a deficit. So it has to be very controlled. And the second uh, most important thing is uh, chance of dislocation because you're not using glue or any even autologous blood you're not using. And the third the problem could be uh, if it's not adherent properly, the third possibility is developing a flap edema, which can go on for a week. And then patient can go in for a, uh, for a flap dislocation at a later date. So these are my uh, worries. And uh, when there is a very simple concept of using autologous blood, combining this with the diathermy might be a, a better uh, concept because in which case, you know, you are giving double protection. So now you're not taking care of the bed, but only the peripheral areas. So you are just uh, attaching the graft to the uh, host, but you've not done anything for the bed. So the, if you combine that with autologous blood, again, it becomes a, a very cheap and an easily doable procedure. Like you said, no diatomy we've been doing ever since we were doing even ECC, we closed the uh, section with diatomy. So, I mean, that was my uh, concern. Uh, can you just uh, enumerate your um, uh, expertise on this over 100 cases? Yes, ma'am. Actually, what you said is absolutely right. Combining the autologous serum part of it would be an additional thing. But what I have noticed is even when you dry the conjunctiva, uh, both sides, and take a little larger flap, that is the only thing that the flap should be a little larger. As you said, there is a tissue contraction. So it should be very controlled and a very low level of diathermy has to be used. But it works so well that uh, I got really uh, motivated to do more of that. And there were no complications as such. And one odd time, if at all the flat uh, one side, you know, it doesn't get attached. Over the next two or three days, the conjunctiva heals on itself. Uh, just if you just put a little swab it back to the position, sometimes like in conjunctival injuries and all, even if you don't suture also the conjunctiva heals. So once you're able yeah. to secure, a, secure three fourths of it also, the flat does not dislocate unless the diathermy has not been done properly. So I feel that tissue glue is pretty expensive and it will be very easy for everybody who is a normal uh, general ophthalmologist who's been doing uh, terigium excision can take on this technique and uh, help out a lot of people even in rural sector. So that is why I wanted to present it. Very good. Very, good. very nice. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jyoti. So uh, next we have Dr. Kirandeep Kaur will be uh, speaking on challenging the unchallenged warrior and uh, a request uh, thank you sir dr aditya kelkar uh, ready with this question for her thank you sir uh, first of all uh, good afternoon everyone i would like to thank uh, aiic for giving me this opportunity and now i will share my screen
Challenging the Unchallenged Warrior, an untold story. Since the COVID-19 pandemic has begun, millions have been infected and hundreds of thousands have succumbed to the deadly virus. The virus has been spreading rapidly with a sharp rise in COVID cases throughout the country. Apart from droplet and contact spread, there is well-proven evidence of spread of virus through ocular surface as well. Thus, the need of the hour was to get back to work with utmost safety measures. Our aim of this presentation is to highlight simple yet effective measures which not only ensure safety but maximize team output while taking care of patients. Here, we discuss some simple, cost-effective, easy replicable steps adopted by our institute. Hand washing facility has been provided at the entrance since the onset of pandemic. Apart from thermal screening, footwear are sanitized as patients are made to stand on mats soaked in 2.25% of benzalkonium chloride. The registration counters have been shielded and facilitated with mics to allow easy conversation without need for removing masks. Medical registration numbers are displayed prominently over cards. Colored footprints for guiding patients are used to help patients to reach designated areas of examination. This has helped in preventing physical contact of MLOPs with patient. Self-designed sanitizer dispenser has been deployed at appropriate places. A simple yet innovative ways of obtaining history over phone has been very effective in limiting physical exposure time. Do-it-yourself face shield models with eye protection have been widely accepted for use. The close contact in fundoscopy is being avoided by using fundus photography as a routine. A separate triage area for patients presenting with conjunctivitis or COVID symptoms was designed using plastic sheets. Procedures like HFA are explained and demonstrated with videos, thus preventing extra contact time of MLOPs with patient. Few special modifications in pediatric ophthalmology include use of IV tubings to ensure proper fitting of mask, acrylic sheets with cutouts has been designed for safe retinoscopy, Photo screeners are being used for patients presenting with redness and recent history of COVID symptoms. Prism glasses allow evaluation of infants, preventing close contact with patients. Self-designed slit lamp shields with attractive targets allow safe examinations with cooperation from younger patients. Do-it-yourself intubation hoods have been designed using PVC pipes and plastic covers which allow safe intubation and extubation procedures. Apart from the innovations in clinical work, events like Hackathon by involving MLOPs and young trainee doctors played an important role in improvising the understanding of basic concepts. Few models like 3D eye model for slit lamp examination, indirect ophthalmoscopy and pan-retinal photocoagulation are products of these events. Writeathon, another 24-hour paper writing event, enabled converting many theses into peer-reviewed publication and has been a major success. Apart from this, the mental health and stress of doctors have been taken care of with an innovative idea of COVID need. The things of basic necessity were made available in the campus even in times of complete lockdown. It is correctly said, there is always a better way of doing things and we need to find it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kiranji. Uh, I would like to request Dr. Aditya Kelkar, sir, uh, yes, to sir. please give your expert comment on this. So I think it's a brilliant presentation, and I think it gives a lot of confidence to the patients when they step into the hospital. They see all these precautions being taken, and they feel very safe. So overall, a very good effort, Dr. Kiranji, and I'm happy you shared this video with us. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you for your presentation. Sir, so we'll move on to the next speaker. Dr. Kelkar, is here. Next is Dr. Kiran Jitsin. Dr. Aditya Kelkar. Take it. We'll move on to the next speaker, Dr. Kiranjit Singh, who will be speaking on Singh's iris prosthesis for large iris defects. Dr. Kiranjit Singh, please. Okay.
Uh, am I audible and the screen visible? We can't hear your audio. Yes, yes. Is the audio my voice is uh, audible? Yes, it's yes, audible. Yes. Okay, okay. So I am going to talk about iris processes, and uh, we have been uh, listening and seeing uh, those iris segments, uh, which which are Im implanted in the capsular bag. Which have been applied somewhere else. So I can. So, so I have uh, innovated a, a device out of Iris Claw platform. And uh, when there is no, no capsular bag or there is no sulcus where we can put the usual segment, we can uh, actually attach the Iris segment to the remaining iris so i'll be showing you two cases so this is a case of a roadside accident to the area of missing iris so there is i think my pre recorded voice is also going along you can just mute one at the plane of the iris so this is a patient with a roadside accident and he had a very long uh, corneous, uh, that scleral tear and which was sutured three months back. Now the patient's, uh, patient comes with cataract and vitreous hemorrhage and uh, he has a lot of photophobia with which he cannot open the eye in the sunlight. So, so cataract is soft and it is taken out. The lens is implanted in the capsule bag. What to do about the defect? So the patient is going to have a lot of photophobia because of the missing iris. So the patient is going to have photophobia. And uh, I have so many examples with me when uh, the photophobia can actually cause uh, amblyopia or it can cause uh, ptosis also. So a pupiloplasty, which is in fashion these days, it is just going to... Uh, uh, make the pupil in a in the sh uh, shape of a slit and then we'll have to cut the iris or the pupil with a protractor so this is the uh, device which have innovated out of iris claw platform this is black uh, colored pmma and it has claws on e either side it is uh, brought behind the iris taking the segment behind and the Iris is tucked the in the is, claw. The iris is enclaved in the claw on one side. And on the other hand. And the, the, then the hands are switched. After the instruments are switched. Over and the, the other side is also fixed to the back of the iris. The so it takes a very short while to implant uh, this uh, and the iris, is fixed. Uh, iris segment. And I know there is uh, more modification has to be done as far as color is concerned and uh, the haptics coming in the pupil area. So this is a second patient with a fingernail injury. And there was traumatic cataract. And there was a cylindrical error of six. There was a cylindrical error of uh, six diopters. The patient came to me with a lot of discharge. So I gave him antibiotics and I calculated the power of the lens and ordered the toric lens. The patient came to me after a month or so. So uh, this is a uh, toric eye well with the serrated margins, serrated haptics, so that the lens doesn't slip from its uh, usual intended place. Slip back from its intended position of fixation. So uh, this is the same segment, slightly uh, smaller in size. In the same way, it is held with the clemen forceps taken behind the iris and done the enclavation and i have done around six cases patients they don't feel any kind of photophobia in bright sunlight also after switching the instruments and switching hands and again this patient came to me in the opd two hours after surgery and his vision was uncorrected six by six and i took him to the bright and in the uh, open in the sunlight and he was able to open both his eyes equally Seven gauge cannula or a needle. So you can use uh, this is two hours, two hours post op, uncorrected vision is six by six. Vision is six by six. Thank we you. We have done around six cases.
and they are all doing great. They don't experience you know, any photophobia in them. I think that is all. I can stop here. Thank you. I would like to request Dr. Pashupati, sir, to please give your comment. Uh, thank you, Satyajit. Ilan Kumar and Pashupati is my father's name. Uh, <laughs> I would rather sir, say Ilan only. <laughs> uh, sir, it was an excellent uh, presentation, very good innovation also. Uh, do you, I, I know you'll be preparing this probably in uh, because of the Iris Claw, uh, Ivo Oil, what you have mastered. Among but uh, is it available commercially, number one? Number two, how do you decide the size? Do you use any measurements, sir? Uh, I got it made from uh, this IOCare company. Okay. And uh, they made it on my request. And yeah. as, as far as the sizing is, is concerned, I don't use any caliper or uh, just imagination. Even if it is slightly bigger, it doesn't matter. Basically, it is the aim is to block the area from where the extra light is going in and causing photo photophobia. And uh, uh, the one more point I want to stress is that's, that these days, um, th this four throw people plastic is, is an end thing. But I feel if you have a working sphincter in three fourth of the area, there is no point in suturing the uh, rest of the pupil and making it small and then traumatizing the uh, iris and the sphincter and making it a dead thing. Uh, after doing some uh, uh, that uh, sphincterotomy with the tractor probe. So when you have such a device, you can always dilate the pupil. You can have a look at the fundus and the patient will have a normal pupil reaction with the rest of the pupil. So, and, and, and that fourth row pupil capacity, I'll, uh, that is a great thing, but uh, I think that has more role in cases of Zavalia syndrome or in cases of, uh, in cases of uh, cynical angle closure, in which is, in which there are complicated uh, pseudophagy also, and the doctor has to do a, a DSEC also. He doesn't, uh, he, he cannot afford to have cynical all around because they can always uh, cause glaucoma uh, in the near future, on the late future. So it has a role in angle, cynical angle closure and this Zavalia uh, syndrome. But when the rest of the pupil is working, you should just implant the iris segment. Uh, that is my feeling. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Ellen. Thank you, Dr. Kiranjit Singh, sir. Uh, we'll move on to the next uh, presentation by Dr. Pawan Kumar MG. Uh, PowerPoint animation for, lear for learning SICS surgery. Dr. Pawan Kumar, please. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I thank AIOS ARC committee for providing me this wonderful opportunity to present in this uh, under the Apple Tree Forum. I'm sharing my screen now. Sir, are you able to see my screen, sir? Yeah, we can see. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, sir. So uh, this idea came to me around two years back uh, since I'm an SSS trainer. I used to train a few residents and fellows. Uh, I used to see what struggle they used to have. And uh, whenever I was trying to convince them or tell them some concepts, they always found it a little difficult. They're not able to understand. Uh, sometimes uh, some things would used to be so complex that uh, some diagrams or videos will also be a little difficult. As all of us know, to excel in cataract surgery, we need to understand the concepts and the basics of uh, cataract surgery steps. And uh, we have so many theory, uh, material, diagrams, illustrations to understand all these uh, surgical steps. At the same time, we have surgical videos. However, in certain situations, certain complex, uh, there can be some complex to understand some uh, surgical steps uh, where the animation comes into play. So as all of us know, animation can simplify the concept and uh, the viewer can easily understand. So animations uh, gives the confidence for the surgeon to understand and then operate and this performance will be greatly improved and surgical outcomes will also be more favorable. However, to make an animation which is playing on the right side uh, so well, we need to have a good uh, animator and we need to spend a lot of money at the same time, a lot of time and 
they have to keep explaining the uh, animator that this is the step that is the step so that takes lots of effort so i wanted to try a jugad way to make a simple animations so that everybody can understand so there i came on came uh, in to this microsoft powerpoint where i started exploring the various features of this microsoft powerpoint where you can get uh, different features like a drawing uh, uh, option is also there then we have so much of uh, transition uh, uh, <laughs> features especially morph animations and then you can add so many animations to the shapes and the, whatever the diagrams you make so uh, to show a few examples uh, as we know this is the crescent and this is the heel so we teach everybody all the residents that it has to be crescent heel has to be up when we are dissecting the sclera and it has to be down when dissecting the cornea so to make it more understanding as you, as we see that in the sclera the heel has to be kept up and as soon as we enter in the cornea the heel has to be go down suppose if we don't follow this then what happens it can easily go into premature entry where the iris stays nearby and iris can collapse at the same time if we bend it too much then it can enter too much into the cornea and it can cause button folding so this this will make the resident understand oh this is the exact concept and why we should do this similarly beginners tend to fail making the side pockets so the importance of side pocket is not understood because they make an inter dissection and outer dissection but they don't dissect pockets so that will lead to a bottleneck configuration instead of a trapezoid configuration leading to nucleus is very difficult so by making a pocket we can make them understand through this animation that by doing a side pocket the nucleus delivery becomes smoother next the one more more important thing whenever we tell them don't inject any fluid or visco when you are within the side port wound we have to always inject when we enter the anterior chamber so this animation shows that if we inject the fluid within the side port then it can go hit the desmoid membrane and it can cause desmoid membrane detachment similarly whenever we are doing a vectus uh, nucleus delivery we have to make sure that we have to visualize the inferior edge of the vectus under the cataract however the hardness of the cataract may be so make this concept understandable if the vectus is under the nucleus it is easily visible if it is not visible then that means it is under the iris and pulling it can cause inferior iridosis so this animation makes it understand more clear so there are multiple uh, uh, steps like this where depressing the lower lip causes wound opening at the same time you have to lift the upper lip so that uh, the wound keeps uh, uh, closed all the time so all these basic concepts can be easily made them understandable once we show all the simple animations so there are lots and lots of animations i have created and all these animations are put up in a youtube channel just for the sake of time i'm just jumping this so these are the uh, video link for lots of animations which i created and we up to upload in our our youtube youtube channel and this is uh, playing as m6 series and which has almost overall got 1 lakh plus views and recently this has been recognized by one of the international uh, also sources for uh, ssas where they have quoted our uh, work which is uploaded in the our youtube and they have referred this as a source to learn ssas so in conclusion powerpoint animations make it simple and easy to create all these animations we can do it by ourselves it doesn't consume much time and it can be used as slides and converted to videos very easily thank you thank you dr pawan Uh, I'd like to request Dr. Rajshekhar sir to please give your expert comments. Thank you, Dr. Satyajit. Uh, Dr. Pawan, it's a nice presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, you are very close to learning animations. That's what it looks like. It's a good tool to teach. But how easy is it to learn uh, this amount of uh, PowerPoint skills? Sir, it's very easy, sir. We just have to understand. how the animations and transition behaves so most of this animations what i have made is just slight transitions that is an option called morph transition we just have to keep all the things in one place and next slide we have to just uh, arrange it in such a way that if you apply morph animation automatically it will move the time frame where, where all you can apply this uh, pawan uh, i didn't get you sir where all means where all you can apply this uh, similar application where else you can apply this all the all the surgical steps can be made very easier i'm working on feco animations also now uh, that also becomes more easier and i'm working actually on uh, glaucoma surgeries since i'm a glaucoma consultant and uh, it is in the process since we have completed making this uh, sss animations the next series will be on feco and the glaucoma surgeries sir. 
so for me you know it will be very useful if a doctor himself or herself can do it so well yes sir yes sir yes sir is it possible uh, that uh, people can what's the learning curve it's very easy sir there are so many youtube videos available in uh, youtube videos on powerpoint we just have to keep watching 5 to 10 videos and then we'll become master so nobody taught me powerpoint i just uh, we all know that we can make slides we can present it but just a little bit exploring of the simple uh, powerpoint tool can uh, get us all this uh, ideas sir i think that we know the wants to ask some question you know no no it's alright yeah yeah uh, it's Good quite sujatha dr helen yeah and uh, pavan it was a fantastic presentation okay sujatha ma'am Uh, is that uh, do you have to do a lot of drawing to get this uh, all these no. animations done? Do you no, draw madam, no, those madam. Uh, things? Uh, yes, madam. It's it's all there in the shapes option, madam. If we just open up the PowerPoint and go for insert option, there is an option yeah. called shape. So okay. what we can do is we can just combine multiple yeah, shapes and then we can group it or we can. There is yeah. one more option called merge shapes. We can just merge everything and make it into a single uh, uh, shape, madam. It's very easy, madam. If okay. you learn it, it and becomes. And then how do you upload animation? Yes, madam. So okay. what we have okay. to do is, as so you see, like yes, madam. I, I just just yes, 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 yes. As you saw in the first animation where the crescent was there, so what was that? It was there in the first in the slide position. What I did was I just copied, duplicated the slide. The next slide, I just moved the uh, crescent, what mean whatever way I want. So I don't have to do anything else. Then for the second slide, I just have to apply morph animation. So once I apply morph animation, the PowerPoint is so good that it will cause a smooth, smooth transition that. We, it appears that it is animated and actually moving, so it's as simple as that. Yeah, I agree on this. Uh, it's a very good, simple thing. Only thing you have to look on the PowerPoint presentation. There are a lot of tutorials there. True, sir. And it's very, very easy. One thing is the cropping. Crop you can do in any shape. So that right. helps you to design so many things. You can crop even your picture in various shapes. So that makes the things very, very easy. So using yes, all the shape and cropping, I think you can animate a lot. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good. Uh, as three, but yes. one point I want to add, uh, not only this uh, drawing part, the drawing has been introduced. I think only in the recent PowerPoint slides. True, sir. True, sir. Shapes and things. What you said, you can do anything with this PowerPoint. In fact, I had created uh, in two thousand five or six. I had created the action, the molecular action of cyclospore. On a so anything and everything, not just surgery. It can be created on a PowerPoint. True, sir. Totally agree with you, sir. And these are easily available on the YouTube for anybody who wants to learn. Yes, yes, madam. Yes, madam. Uh, for your, for your, just uh, as an extra thing, I just want to share. I don't have any financial interest. There are uh, one uh, series run by Mr. Ram Gopal. He's a, he runs a channel called Presentation Process. He has hundred plus videos. He teaches all the simple things. He doesn't teach about medical things. He teaches in general PowerPoint uh, basics. From where, from whom I learned, I can call it as PowerPoint guru for me. I wanted hundred plus videos of that, which it is just very simple, eight minutes video each video. We can learn a lot from his presentations. Even I am following uh, this, this guy. It's a very very good deal. Or yes sir, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pawan, for that thank nice you, presentation. And uh, I think we have a uh, lot of time with us. So if Dr. Uh, Ashok Grover is there, Grover sir, are you there? Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Our chairman I, is there. Uh, I think I've um, enjoyed the session thoroughly. As you know, the innovations are the basis of all the progress that has been made by humanity through the ages, and this is more particularly true for science. So it is really heartening that the same process continues in our specialty. I've enjoyed the very good questions that the judges asked and uh, the way the uh, innovators answered. It's a uh, very good sign for the younger generation and some of the other seniors as well who are continuing to innovate and i'm sure we have a very very bright future ahead with these innovations continuing in the fashion that they've been presented thank you if if any of the judges want to ask any question question to any of the presenters they can they are free to ask uh, yes dr ellen please unmute yourself yes sorry sorry Uh, my question is to Dr. John. Is he here? That's yeah, they all are here on this. Uh, uh, I thought I shouldn't be asking. That's why I didn't ask him at that time. Uh, that's a very good innovation. That uh, portable uh, kit, what he has made. Just one question: are, are you commercially doing it, or is it just a? 
John, are you here? Doctor. Doctor John, uh, he's there, but he's muted, I guess. Muted. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, I just wanted to know about that the calipers and the scale. What he had made. The rest of the things he explained, actually. Okay, that, that's all. Okay. Yes. So uh, 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 yes, Malika, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kiranjit Singh, I wanted to know if that device is actually available commercially from IOCare. Dr. Kiranjit Singh. He's not here, but probably... No, but he said it is not... He actually asked this question. Yeah, yeah, you are. It is not available. He had got it made, uh, custom made through that. Yes, oh. yes. He got it custom made and shared videos with us also earlier. So the basic problem, there may be some chances of glaucoma, uh, but he reported a very low incidence in that those cases. In fact, um, aniridia IELs were also uh, initially being made by IOC, but uh, there was some problem with the, the color dispersion and uh, they used to lose color after some time. So um, I have not used this device, but I have used aniridia IULs. And uh, those uh, we procure from a Holland-based uh, off-tech company. So probably there are other devices also available. Uh, IOCare uh, may be making it, but uh, this off-tech uh, off has different colors. You can even uh, custom make um, these things from them. No, the, that was uh, in what happened in that case. There was a printed iris segments. Now this one is a colored iris segment, so it makes a little difference. It's not printed as such, so there will be a little bit of difference. Must be. So Dr. John is there. Uh, Dr. Allen, yes. Dr. John, can you unmute yourself? Yes, sir. Am I yeah, audible yeah. now? Yeah. Yes. 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 Uh, tell me, sir, I missed the question, sir. John, I just wanted to know mm -hmm. a kit that was quite, uh, I mean, I was quite impressed. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know whether it's commercially available, those things. You were talking about the slit lamp uh, thing, but which you made yourself. I don't think that's available. Yes, sir. The rest of the things. Uh, so the refraction set, it is available. Uh, it is uh, developed in uh, MIT and it, um, it, I, I don't know the exact cost, but it is quite affordable. It, it, is, uh, it comes as a kit of uh, uh, not only the automated phone-based refraction, also a phone-based foropter and a phone-based lens meter. These three devices together, it comes to, I believe, around a lakh. Um, so, and it's pretty accurate. Uh, the apps, most of them are free. There are a few paid apps, but most of the apps are free, mostly because they are made by hobbyists without uh, the help of any doctor, without validation, just as a project by engineering students often. So most of them are free. There are a few paid ones which uh, are not having much patronage. Uh, then uh, things like this, I believe I can make it, uh, uh, I can uh, make it commercialized. I, I think I will plan to do that. So that is uh, indeed uh, a suggestion which I have I've been receiving for some time. So I'll do that. Even the keratoscope is something which is uh, not very accurate, but this can help the general practitioner to get a good idea without sending off the patient to a higher center. So at least they have an idea whether this patient seems to be a keratoconus or not so that they can decide. So there is a role for all. Even the accuracy is less, there is a role for it. Yeah. So John has made so many apps that we started calling him App Man, no? <laughs> <laughs> I have written a story. Actually, I've written a blog post on, uh, on our PMR search, Dr. Uh, uh, eofta.com about my journey into the app space. So I started with... Uh, making games while I was doing uh, my schooling and we started basic and in fact we started logo in uh, lower classes and in sixth standard we started with Q basic and uh, me and a friend of mine we made a car racing game in Q basic and our teachers did not even know that it was possible 
so we ended up mm. making games and they wanted me to become an engineer and in fact my computer teacher still tells me i told you you should have been an engineer <laughs> but i am now an engineer of the eye so that is <laughs> one of the most sophisticated pieces of Very equipment nice. i have seen but our luck <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we all know that three of the participants from this session they will be selected uh, on the marks given by judges and they'll be going to the final rounds so i think uh, thank you very much to our uh, chairperson dr grosser for giving so much time to all the judges for uh, for the wonderful questions and uh, full involvement in the session and to all the participants for bringing in their innovative ideas and making this uh, session a very fruitful one so once again i i'd like to thank all of you from entire team arc for uh, this session thank you thank you very much thank you thank, thank you, you. Dr. Harshal. thank you sir thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you sir thank you. thanks